everyone. Hi. <laughs> uh, welcome along. We are so pleased to have you here and we're so excited about the conversations that are going to happen over the course of today and that where this community is going to go from here. Um, it's the big one. Okay. Um, I want to say as well, I, I get to follow Lou quite a lot in <laughs> events like this, and you are such a powerhouse, thank you, for everything that you do. Um, okay, so um, this is uh, a lot of designers that we interview for Code for America. This is something that they say at some point in their interview process, every single time. This will always come up. They want to work on something meaningful. Uh, and that's fantastic because there are so many options at the moment for how you can do that as a designer. And these are some of them that, um, that I was thinking through. You can go uh, work in the back office of somewhere in Google and come up with some amazing technology. You can go do client work, which is super high quality with a bunch of different agencies. If you're brave, you can go work in government. You can go tackle the issues right at the center of government. At whatever level, you can work at a non-profit, or you can branch out on your own and do your own thing as an entrepreneur. Um, and so this makes me want to go back about 15 years or so to when that didn't exist. Those options didn't exist. And I was talking to Ariel earlier around, none of this was here. You couldn't do anything as a designer who wanted to work on something meaningful. So I wanted to just take that journey for a second. This was, uh, this was the stuff I was reading about the time that I was graduating, um, about how to be a designer, but uh, how, to use that, uh, how to use that role in a way that felt significant in the world around you. I was making work like this, which this is vinyl cut letters stuck to the outside of a building and then encouraging my friends to stand underneath it and look casual. Is it an advert? Is it not an advert? We don't know. This weird, weird stuff. Uh, and a portfolio of things that looked exactly like that and were trying to tackle social challenges. And taking my portfolio around and speaking to different agencies in London, one of them said, your portfolio looks like a, a selection of Hallmark cards, which are like very <laughs> sentimental. Oh, you have Hallmark, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> Hallmark, sorry. <laughs> um, and there was just nowhere to go as a designer at that stage. Uh, and then green shoots started appearing. So there was a group of designers working out of the Design Council in London that um, were doing using design in different settings, so in healthcare, in prison um, services, in rehabilitation, in schools, and they were starting to publish papers about them. And to me, uh, in um, university at that time, and trying to find anything that felt like a future, this was gold, this was the Bible. They were called red design. They were managing to articulate a language around the type of design that I really was longing for, really yearning for. And also, they just had these, look at that white space on that. <laughs> look at that echo of Swiss design. I love that stuff. They were everything I wanted to be. And this makes me think, actually, your book, Lou, is going to be that for people. Um, transformative design is what they were calling it. And it, just having a language around it became incredibly important. Because I could, I could call it a thing. I could go talk to people about it. I could look for content around it. Uh, which landed me here. Think Public were another agency in London at the time that were doing work around um, social challenges. They also struggled to find a language around that, uh, which I'll show you in a second. This is the stuff we were doing. It was all, this was always what we were doing. It was always a drafty hall in somewhere in the middle of nowhere, designing things with the community um, together and trying to come up with better solutions. I don't know why there were so many balloons. I really do. They always were and bunting. And this was us. There was a definite. 90s TV sitcom vibe <laughs> to our aesthetic. <laughs> I think we thought we were in Friends. And I think there's one tagline up there about big design challenge issues, something. And then uh, this was what they, they landed on in terms of articulating what they were doing. So tackling social challenges with design. This was gold to me. This was absolute gold. Uh, I was so pleased to be able to find a, a home to be able to do the stuff that I felt was important. And then across the pond, so in New York, uh, Stefan Sagmeister, anyone remember him? Yeah, 
Arts. He was a little kind of superstar in the graphic design world. He's, t- he's gone a bit too <coughs> naked now, but he was doing a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot of naked. Uh, he was uh, carving the type for um, a poster into his skin at that point, very kind of controversial and headline grabbing. Um, and he set another type of brief around design. So he said it should be possible to touch someone's heart with design, that music can touch someone's heart, that reading a novel or watching a movie can really affect you emotionally. And how can design do that? So long story short, he said this is an international competition. I managed to win it. I'm not going to show you what I did, but come find me afterwards if you want to find out. They sent me to New York to meet Sagmeister. I had no money, absolutely no money. They gave me a bunch of stuff, um, but I was living in a um, caravan, I would call that, a trailer, <laughs> no money, student. They gave me, the head of HP came along on a stage and gave me a large format printer, <laughs> shook my hand and said, this was the dream, man, this is me and my caravan, I had a cat and a large format printer, and I had won this design game. <laughs> um, okay. I also, Sagmeister is a good person. I had no money and was in New York for the first time. He was like, you should go to galleries. I was like, I have no money. And he paid for me to go all around Chelsea galleries and just go do a bunch of stuff. Good man. Don't get naked with him. Uh, <laughs> which I didn't. So anyway, back to... <laughs> bring it back, Hannah, bring it back. <laughs> back to uh, 2019. Um... And back to these options, so as a designer, you can work at a non- non-profit. I wanted to talk a little bit about Code for America. It's a, our history has meant that um, there are some misperceptions or some myths around what we do. So I just wanted to share a couple of examples of what we do to give you a good sense of that. And as a non-profit, um, I've been inside government, inside federal government, and then uh, inside local government or working in partnership with local government. The difference to me for a non-profit <coughs> is that We definitely occupy the intersection between the user and and government itself. We're able to set our own scope and determine our own specifications and work towards them, so we're in control in that way. We often get to do the work that inside federal government we kind of never got to reach. Once you've kind of done the MVP, then it's often, uh, you're often onto the next priority. But there are cons as well. Uh, We often have to prove the case for what we're doing at the same time as we're doing it. So there isn't a sense of uh, getting the work signed off and then the freedom to work on it for the next couple of years. Um, And we also have to, we're a non-profit, so we have to find the leverage and the power to be able to have the impact that we want to have. Nobody hands it to us. And so a lot of the work is making a case for the thing, creating the power for the thing to have the impact that we want to see at the same time as doing the work. So a couple of examples of that, we often use products and building products quickly to create the power needed for lasting change. So uh, across the US, 40 million people rely on safety net programs like Medicaid, food assistance, and then a a string of acronyms, so TANF, LIHEAP, WIC, um, uh, to relieve the effects of poverty, so to prevent them falling into the cycle of poverty that is then very difficult to break. But across the US, there are large gaps in the participation of people who are using these benefits, even if they are eligible. And in California specifically, there is a really large participation gap in the people applying for food assistance who are eligible. Uh, We think this has something to do with it. So this is the application form for food assistance in California. It's a little clunky. It's around 50 pages or so. Takes about an hour to complete. Uh, it's not mobile responsive. And it's pretty typical of the standard of um, application for any benefit across the country at the moment. And we know that because we applied for five different benefits programs, the top five benefits programs in every state across the US, the same uh, programs. And then we're able to start to diagnose what's the baseline out there, what's the quality of uh, service provision like. And it's pretty low. So um, there's a couple of screens here, but there's a there's a bit of a horror show of usability examples that we've got, um, which some of it's going to be shown at some over the next couple of days. And what you'll often see, which you can see here, is that they're mirroring. Uh, this is pretty much a form that would sit on a caseworker's 
um, desk and they would fill out for each person and so they've built the service pretty much to mirror the form and if you're trying to use that on a mobile um, on a cell sorry um, oops this does its same thing this clicker okay um, yeah, if you're trying to use any of these sites on a cell, it becomes really difficult. It's like you're staring at it through a little pinhole. This is New Jersey site, um, which if you're on there for an hour, uh, it's insane. It's uh, would you have the patience to get through that, get through that form over the course of an hour? <clears throat> Less than half of the online applications in the US are mobile responsive. And for the users who are applying for these services, their phone is their, is their computer. And last year was the first time that more people own a smartphone than they do a computer. And so the a cultural shift is happening, but government isn't keeping up. They aren't able to respond in the way that um, they don't understand how users are behaving and they aren't able to change their services to match them fast enough. And it's not just the application, so this, which you can't read, I realise, is the communication uh, that you would receive if you were on five benefits programmes at the same time, which is pretty common. And so this communication, which this is some of it in detail, um, will not come to your phone, it will come through the mail, uh, so letters in the mail, and some of it will land on your kind of portal, local portal, and you have to go in and look at it. But just the volume, yeah, just the volume that you can see across five different benefits is almost a full-time job, just keeping up with all of that communication and what you're required to do. And so there are some simple answers to this. Um, building a, a better product is a, a quick way to be able to start to uh, create change in the system. So we're not wedded to the products that we build, but we do use them to be able to create leverage in a space. And so... This one's pretty simple. In California, just create a better mobile um, user-centered application for food assistance. That's kind of the easy bit. Then it starts get oh, we call it get cow fresh. Um, and then it starts getting complicated. So California has 58 different counties. We then went county by county by county implementing this uh, product. And that means creating a partnership with each of those 58 different stakeholders, showing them the value of the work, getting the implementation right, getting our back end to mirror um, what they need to be able to receive our applications. And it's pretty slow work um, with the overall aim of reducing the participation gap in California. And so I think we're about five years later, something like that now. Um, we're across all of California as of this week. Um, we have around, last week we had our highest application volume, which was around 3,800 in, in any one day, and so 800,000 total and climbing, and we have a pretty good um, set of outcomes for people that are opting into, there's an online chat and there's notifications that come up during the day. Caesar is here who answers the online chat. Where are you, Caesar? Ooh, who's answering those calls today now? <laughs> All right, today's a quiet day. Um, and so that's California, and we're starting to see outcomes. We're starting to be able to create evidence that is incredibly compelling to uh, the state. We're also able to uh, create a feedback loop. So we've got enough data now on the scale of system to be able to show back to counties and say, these are how all of the different counties are administering this service, and these are, these are the drop-off points, these are where things are going wrong. Uh, but there's so much more to do across the entire country. Um, the ability to create high quality services that people can use when they need to rely on safety nets um, support is really low at the moment. Um, and so we're doing pilots in several, a handful of different states across the country to be able to start to create proof points of how things can change and what could be different. And we're not intending to be a vendor across this space, so we want to be able to shape the market and change things, become a catalyst and create a tipping point, but then allow the market to swallow up. So other vendors, other um, technologists, other organisations to be able to work with government and help support them to build the best possible services. And then what's interesting that falls out of this work is that... Um, there, especially from a design perspective, so um, there's a stigma attached in a lot of cases to receiving safety net services, and yet 
The majority of people will, or half of all Americans will use SNAP in their lifetime. We have on the current product an open text field at the end of the application that says, is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Which I don't think we'd be allowed to do in government, but non-profit. Um, and these are the types of stories that come through. So people are quite reluctant to be able to ask for help. Um, but the media often spins them as kind of takers rather than people that uh, have hit a hard time and need support. And so one of the designers on the work, uh, the, a data scientist, sorry, on the team had done some analysis of who are the people in California who are using food assistance and had done some really great um, uh, analysis around that. The designer spotted that um, it was a little dry, a little dry. Uh, we were going to publish it, but it was very much a, a data science paper. And so we started to think about how can we bring design and visual communication to uh, these findings and be able to publish them and share them in a way which starts to break down the stigma around who are the people that actually use food assistance in California. And so we made a, a microsite that publishes some of that work and you can click through different counties and understand different stories from people in their own words and then some myth-busting pieces around what people think versus the actual reality with some data set behind it and a huge data set set behind it. Um, okay, and then a couple of other examples. So we try and create technology that is impossible not to use. So one in four people in the US has a criminal record um, which has life-altering consequences for them. And this is disproportionately affecting low-income communities and people of colour. Um, with the introduction of new legislation, some of these records are eligible for expungement or clearance, and having that criminal record off your background check makes a huge difference. And so we, uh, from a, uh, we built an algorithm which basically reads the uh, somebody's rap sheet, so their police record, determines which. Um, which of their convictions are eligible for expungement and then packages up the court forms ready to file a motion to clear their record and all of that is done in seconds. We've managed to go through the el eligibility rules and be able to create an algorithm and train it to um, <coughs> clear records in different states. This makes me laugh because the BBC came to film the whole thing and this is, this is how you film an algorithm. <laughs> basically track around an engineer. <laughs> nice. Uh, what we didn't realise was that district attorneys love press and that power has come from um, a power has come from our ability to give them a platform. So once they've cleared the records, basically they put a lot of shade on everybody else who hasn't cleared their records. They kind of say, well if it takes 30 seconds, why aren't you doing it? And if you're not doing it, then it's clearly not because you can't do it, it's because you don't want to do it. What does that mean about you? <laughs> and so uh, we've got a huge amount of momentum behind the work. But again, the algorithm is not as important to us as the, the potential to be able to create change across this space and the impact. We're doing several pilots across the country and with the aim to clear all eligible records by 2023. And it also gives us a position to, once we've got all of the actors around record clearance in any one state, we're able to do this kind of magic, say service map magic, which you all know, um, and having the stakeholders convene around a single map of here's the user um, experience of your service, here are all the different stakeholders, and start conversations between them about why aren't we joining up different aspects of this. And then the last element, which, um, which is kind of the lead into today and the summit over the next couple of days is that we need enough designers and technologists to match the scale of the challenge. We have a brigade network who are literally next door right now. Uh, 44 different brigades, chapters across the country and they are volunteers who show up uh, to work on local issues in their local area every week. They amaze me. There are, uh, um, hang on, I got that wrong, 44,000. Oh, say again. Oh, God. <laughs> um, this is what they call themselves. And for me, um, 
I used to work in the Ministry of Justice in the UK and just the scale of the issues there and the length of time that it's going to take to change them, and that's the UK, which is uh, a fraction of the size of the US, just makes me feel like we need an army. We need an army of people to be able to create change in government. And so a really interesting question for us at the moment is, what does it mean to have 40,000 people that really care about these issues and want to change them? And how can designers and technologists help them to be able to do that? So thank you very much and enjoy today. It's going to be amazing.